Well, let me start. I am Margaret Todd. I'm the county librarian for the County of Los Angeles Public Library, not Los Angeles Public Library. That's the city library. We are the largest public library in the United States in terms of number of facilities. Uh, we serve 3.4 million people over 3,100 square miles, 50 cities plus most of the unincorporated areas. I have about 80 plus school districts in my service area and at least 90 distinct communities. Think about High Desert, Antelope Valley, Beach Cities, Malibu, Manhattan Beach, East Los Angeles. That gives you a sense of the, the diversity. And every single community is unique and has different needs. Just give you a little bit on that as we talk about why am I standing here today? Because we were talking to OL, OCL about our strategic planning process, which we've been working on for about a year. We know that this is a key strategic plan for the county library, because if we're going to stay relevant in the 21st century, we have to do some shifting of priorities. So we spent a great deal of time. We did polling. We did surveys. We did demographic studies, data studies, stakeholder interviews. And we have a community advisory group made up of business and community leaders in the county. And let me tell you some facts that stood out for us. First of all, in our polling, the good news is, is that our communities love us. We are a very trusted institution as opposed to, I think, FIRE's the only one left that is also trusted. Uh, <laughs> so that's wonderful. And this is California. They were actually willing to pay higher taxes, to pay higher salaries to my field staff. That's amazing. Now, not a dime for administrators. They made it very clear that I was not to get a penny more. But I think it tells, tells you how strongly those communities feel they need that library and strong sense of ownership. It's very much their library. What, did we, what else did we see as we started looking around? Um, one of the things that just really shocked us is when we looked at the dropout rates. And in some of our districts, near 40% of the students are not getting their, um, not meeting graduation, not getting there. Now some of them, certainly some of the districts are excellent, they're at like 99.9%, .9%, but that's a scary number. And if you see that little comment from the LA Times, um, it's, it's sobering. Also, I serve on the Educational Reform Committee for the uh, County for the Probation Department, and they were looking at reforming their education program for uh, the juvenile offenders that are in custody. And one of the facts that came out to us is that we saw every time they assessed any uh, young person that was arrested by probation, they were not anywhere near their grade level in educational attainment. So our advisory council asked us two questions. First of all, how will LA have a workforce with the right skills for the 21st century when we see in some, some of the districts 40% are not even finishing high school? What will happen to these young people? They've not succeeded in the traditional education track. How are they going to catch up? Other fact we saw. Learning is so dynamic right now. The pace is very fast. We have to learn new things, and we have to go back and refresh and relearn over and over again. And you're not going to have five years to get around to it. In uh, 2011, Library a Journal did a director's forum, and there was a futurist there. He challenged us by telling us that he felt within... 20 to 30 years, we would see the end of public education as we know it, that it will look very, very different. He uh, pointed out to us the increased number of homeschoolers throughout the country at all income levels. And his challenge was that public libraries need to look for collaborations beyond the traditional K-12, uh, you know, go to the classroom, say hi to the kids, that, that type of collaboration. Next point. In California, our 
uh, public educa uh, higher education has been decimated. I don't know that if any of you spoke with our UC colleagues who's here, uh, two of them I know are here, Irvine and Berkeley, they have, you know, it has been traumatic because California's never taken cuts like that. In our community colleges, for the most part, they are no longer doing what was traditionally called continuing ed. They are now fully focused on making sure that the people in their schools can finish their requirements so they can transfer to a four-year, or they can get their associate degree to be nurses, fire, police, whatever. So just going to community college to catch up on your computer skills is no longer an option in Southern California. Another issue for many of our communities that we serve is the high cost of college. Uh, they literally, I think someone pointed out yesterday, uh, you can't work part time and go to school anymore. That's, that's just not even possible. Even in our state colleges, the tuitions have gone up significantly so that that has become a huge challenge. So we looked at all these facts and we realized that there's a role for the public library in this arena. So one of our initiatives in our strategic plan is going to be center of learning. And yes, we're looking at all the traditional pieces of that. For example, our emphasis on early literacy with families and, and obviously um, homework support and that type of thing. But now we're looking at our virtual world because we think we have a part to play for our communities. We have our toe in the water. So she said I was the expert. I'm really embarrassed because that's not true. Uh, we're, I suppose we're just the experimenters. Maybe that's the correct term. And I have colleagues in um, many of our libraries throughout the United States that are doing more than we do right now. So trust me, not the expert, just the experimenter. For the last eight years, we've used something called Live Homework Help, which uh, we subscribe from tutor.com. 20 minutes of free tutoring for students, uh, first grade through first year college. Recently, they've expanded that to include resume writing and some college courses. The response has been amazing. The success, the satisfaction rates are sky high. In the recession, and let me get, I'm gonna go on one more here. Let me get through here. I just wanna move through this. I'm going to get to this in a second. In the recession, we were inundated with adults desperate to learn how to write a resume, to refresh their basic skills, and technology literacy. People, and not all 50-year-olds, 20-year-olds who did not know how to do a Word document, had no idea how to attach a document, although they're very good at Facebook. <laughs> But Facebook isn't a huge skill for uh, most employers, so it was not helpful. So in the face of all this, we got a grant from our mental health department to strengthen families. And one of the things they let us do was to work with Gail Sinage and uh, use what they call a product called Ed2Go, which is basically online classes. We chose to do very limited PR because we really just didn't have the time. And we have been amazed at the response. We are, Gail has, uh, Senich has told us that we are getting the most registrations of any public library that's using their product. And I just thought I'd show you some of the classes and some of the comments. Distribution and logistics management. Who knew that was in demand? And boy, and people really are grateful for that. Um, in design, CS5, once again, this is someone who's taken the course on campus and had decided to go back and kind of do a little refresher. Microsoft Excel, I can sympathize with that one. Um, people who find in their jobs, they need to be better at it, and they don't have the time. Uh, word, yes, we're talking about technology uh, literacy issues. Don't even know how to use Word. This is my favorite. How to buy and sell on eBay. <laughs> hey, you know, 
I, what else, where else would you go but your public library to figure out how to make a fortune? <laughs> Spanish for medical professionals. Person speaks Spanish, but they needed quickly to get in and to build some vocabulary, and they found the way to do it. So, you know, what about the future? What are we going to do? Well, I saw that in Atlanta Fulton County. They used this idea to help people get their GEDs, and uh, John Sabo was at the director at the time at Atlanta. Amazing number of people got their GEDs by doing the online through the library. So I really am seeing the power of this. We know that libraries create community. And everything we've heard over the last two days about how the learners on these sites are building their own communities. So I think a public library is a perfect place for that. But what about the physical space? Many of these courses, people want to get together in person and talk about it. So we're looking at the idea of why can't the public library be a partner and say, you know, if you're in the LA area and you're signed up for this class, y'all can show up at the East LA Library at 10 a.m. on Saturday and work on your projects or talk or whatever. So we're going to start approaching some people to see about that as an option. Are we going to create content? Maybe. But for us, we're really more into collaboration, maybe collaborating with one of our community colleges or maybe one of our four-year colleges about putting something on our site that would serve the public, not, maybe not as academic in nature, but um, something practical. We also are looking at something called parent cafes. This is something we learned to do through our mental health grant, where parents come to the library and talk about their child raising issues. Basically, it's just of it, raising teenagers. And we're starting to say, well, why can't we do that online? And maybe there should be some coursework with that. So people could maybe meet at the library and talk, but then they could go back and sign up for a Coursera class that says, this will help you learn a little bit. So. That's where we are at the moment. I think it's a unique time. And I do think, I, I agree very much with what was said earlier, is I think it is going to change. It is a sea change. And I think the libraries are the perfect people to get involved in this because public libraries, we really know how people learn, how where they get stuck, what what ways we can use to help them understand how to download their ebooks or whatever. And we're very willing to share that information with anyone who would like to talk about collaboration. Finally, for me as director, there's two things I really have to think about. First of all, how are we going to measure success? Because we know from what we're hearing, completion rate isn't necessarily a sign of success. Maybe someone only took half the class, but they learned what they needed and they were done. So we're going to have to figure that out. And I have to figure that out because we are not a rich jurisdiction. So whatever I add, I know I'm going to have to take something away. So I need to be sure the direction we go is, is a good direction and that we're successful. Thank you. Jim Mahalko, uh, so I was interested in, in uh, your discussions about the data that you're getting from uh, from both Coursera and edX, and uh, I, I thought it, I, I made me wonder how you square the sort of data collection that you're doing now and, and the ways in which you're going to set priorities for analyzing that data with what I thought was a pretty revealing comment from Christian uh, yesterday who said, 
I have all this data. I don't know what to make out of it. And he's a data guy. Um, so, so you know, the, the sort of counting noses and, you know, sorting people into categories, I mean, that's trivial. The, the stuff that's, that, that is touted as, you know, the transformative um, uh, data dimension is about the relationship of that data to the, um, to the interaction with the content and to the success metric. So I know it's early days, but, but you must have some ideas about where's the low-hanging fruit, what's the kind of priorities you might um, uh, give to that analysis. It's a great question. I, um, one way to think of it, and what we've done is there's there's parallel to this group that we've referenced here about the librarians within the consortium. There's a parallel learning sciences um, representatives, folks who are whether they're in the centers for teaching and learning or instructional design, who are who are teeing up the development of these courses by asking, getting faculty to think about what are their instructional objectives? And then within those, what are the, the sort of components to those instructional objectives? And then running those against the data. So I think it's, it's I think that becomes a faculty development opportunity. Um, so we, we would provide pretty granular data per course, per instructor, per course, per instructor, Excuse me, and then anonymize the data across uh, a, a consortium's uh, all their courses. Example you saw from Penn, for example, and then we would anonymize that data across all of the other partners. So I think that it's um, it is early days. Although many uh, the courses that we've run subsequently um, have all been modified based upon the analytics that the faculty were able to review with instructional design teams. Say, look, these particular videos in this sequence, uh, you're not seeing the click-throughs, or, or you're seeing people. Here's a here's a, a, a novel uh, revelation. Faculty are being real are realizing that that students often mute them. <laughs> So what does that mean? So that's an example where we've seen, I mean, in fact, yesterday in Chronicle Higher Ed, Michael Seema, uh, who's taught some chemistry courses uh, uh, on the edX platform, talked about how he changed his courses. So that's one initial spot. So I think there's a couple things. I think, um, so, you know, there's a lot of conversation about, uh, I think someone mentioned yesterday about the University of Chicago uh, correspondence course platform in 1920, right? And, and uh, looking across stuff, I believe uh, the Open University did online open courses in the 90s, right? So, you know, I think one of the things that's different about massively open online courses is probably the M, the massive. Um, and uh, if you have a population in the thousands or even in the tens of thousands and you take a look at data, so for example, assessments is an area, you know, you may miss, and Daphne Kohler talks about this, you may miss, um, you know, if you're teaching 30 students, 50 students, and your exam isn't quite great, you might just, you might miss that. Where, but if you're, you know, you know if you're teaching twenty thousand students and you know you're teaching this course multiple times, all of a sudden you can see, you know, if people are constantly getting exam questions wrong, it may not be the learner, it may be the teacher. So I think that's that's one area. Um, yeah, and then providing, just like Harris said, providing sort of feedback, um, you know, back to uh, the faculty member in terms of what went on the course is useful. Uh, yeah, on a broader scale, I really think it's, you know, it's it's uh, it is really uh, the on the onus on, you know research committees and faculty, we're, we're starting that, we're developing that now to really have a research committee here of faculty to sort of think about what we want to do with this data and where we want to go. I also think the other thing is we have ends of, you know, while we have lots of students, we have ends of one in many cases, right? We've taught the course once. That's N of one times, you know. So so it's hard to analyze data when you're only dealing with you know, on data points. So I think that, that kind of speaks to some of the thoughts that, that Christian had about that as well. Well, I have a question. Can I ask? Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Okay, great. Um, you know, as as you're you're serving, what is it? You know, seventy thousand people per class or whatever. How do how are the um, the universities justifying serving the masses mm -hmm. versus just who's there? Is it how or have they really? 
dealt with that very deeply at this point. They're just now they're just looking to see what's going on. So, so I think one of the things. Okay, so you know, there's been a lot of efforts in online education, and I think one of the more interesting things, but but places like Penn have not really gone that deeply into this up until now, right? We teach online courses, we do courses for credit, but they're small. Um, you know, missions of community colleges and public institutions are somewhat different, especially community college mission. You know, educating people for as many people as possible, giving them skills in a value price way is different. P- Penn is different. Um, I think so. There are a couple of things that have happened here. I think the conversation about what te- with, with technology enhanced learning, or as we like to call it here at Penn, connected learning, of whether that's a value and whether that's part of the educational process is over. You know, there's no longer, I mean, I've been doing this for years, there's no longer any conversation, right. we're like, we're gonna be like university of not enter some very nice name here, right? This is, this is a genuine part of the conversation. And the f- excitement and the fact that people are enthusiastic about that has made a huge difference. I also think that the fact that a place like Penn, you're either in the conversation and you're shaping the conversation about where we're going or you're standing on the sidelines. And again, I think it's important to be in the conversation. And I think finally, it, as faculty members teach in this new way of teaching, it's having an impact here on, on campus and keeping campus relevant and keeping the people who do come here and um, participate in an on-campus experience to keep, to keep our educational process where to be as a great institution in this world. I mean, in the context of um, edX, one of the founding partners, MIT, has had uh, open courseware for 10 years. I mean, the, the numbers are extraordinary. I mean, uh, um, thousands of courses have been captured and delivered through the OCW portal. And so there's, there was a healthy starting point, I think, from the, from the uh, you, I can't speak for the university, um, but, I, but, but generally the feeling was, well, OCW paved the way, and OCWs at other, obviously at other campuses paved the way to open the door to the notion that, that there's a broader mission to, um, to what MIT was trying to do. And certainly Harvard had, through continuing education, Harvard's thousands of courses that have been mounted up and stowed up online. Um, I think the, the shift now, though, and I think to some degree we see this borne by the universities who are, who are joining this consortium is exactly what, what was just stated is there, there is a, a commitment to both re-examining the implications of big data in these massive online courses globally, but there's also the derivative, you know, understandings, learnings about what will this do to on-campus learning. And that's become the kind of, uh, that's absolutely the conversation we have with every university partner who comes on board, and, and quite honestly, because they're, they're being, they're, they're socializing that reality to their own board, to their own alumni, to their own students, to their own parents, um, and it's part of the process. So I think it, it I'm, you know, tip of the cap to the institutions, to Penn and you know, others who have been able to uh, go down this road. Uh, and have the wherewithal and the means to do so. I think the next chapters are to be written where we look at institutions that don't have the means, um, and we'll see where that plays out. 